is there a q and a with the audience i was actually hoping that they send some questions and we can ask because it will be nice actually so sonal we can prompt the audience so we are live now uh, we can prompt the audience to sort of uh, post their uh, questions in the chat or the qa box or they can even raise their hands to sort of uh, ask a question in case and we'll just give it another uh, 15 20 uh, seconds let's go you know let folks trickle in settle down and uh, we'll just get started okay i have a question manoj will you introduce me or shall i introduce the speakers how does so, that i'll just do a quick uh, context setting and quick introduction and then uh, you can take it from there Hi all. Um, a very very good morning and a very happy 75th Independence Day. Uh, as India uh, marches on its journey of economic prosperity, um, aims to become a five trillion dollar economy and uh, finally seek its rightful place on the global stage, uh, it's it's really important that this progress happens uh, via uh, the right, the just model of growth. um the ongoing pandemic has kind of uh thrown more sort of importance at it and therefore it's really so important to discuss uh, the topic at hand today impact investing the new mainstream uh, we have a very esteemed panel today to discuss this topic in the panel we have anjali bansal who is the founder of avana capital and vinith rai who is the founder and chairman of avishkar group To moderate the panel, we have Sonal Khetarpal, who is the editor SME at the Financial Express. Uh, sit back, participate, enjoy uh, in what promises to be a cracker of a session. Uh, with that, I pass on the baton to Sonal to lead us into the discussion. Over to you, Sonal. Thanks, Manoj. Thanks for the introduction, and I'm looking forward to a very engaging discussion. Good morning, everyone, and a very happy Independence Day to all of you. Today we have with us two eminent speakers to discuss how impact investing is the main new mainstream. Anjali Bansal, founder of Avana Capital, that invests in and provides scaling up support to innovation-led startups for enabling impact at scale while delivering commercial returns. Anjali has invested in and mentored several successful startups, including Delivery, Urban Club, Darwin Box, Nike, and Lenskar. Alongside Anjali, we have Vinith Rai, who is the founder and chairperson of impact investment platform Avishkar Group, that has an entrepreneurship-based development approach. The group today has assets worth 1.1 billion dollars under management, that is impacting 100 million plus lives in Asia and Africa. The COVID-19 pandemic has ushered, has pushed an additional 88 million to 115 million people into extreme poverty. so that would take the world's extreme poor to 150 million leaving many of them with no means to reconstruct their lives an impact investing model offers us all of us an opportunity a gateway to the world to address the most pressing challenges that the pandemic has presented today we will discuss how impact investing is moving from the margins to the mainstream as more and more investors are entering the space it is no longer a niche utopian idea that is against the commercial capital it is no longer a us versus them but the two together are moving together complementing each other before we deep dive into questions um you know maybe we can begin with each of the speakers first deconstructing what impact investment really means since both of you occupy a different space also within this small ecosystem where vinith is one of like a early messengers of the concept and Anjali, you come from a mainstream VC background, so you know um, maybe we can start with Vinit on his opening thoughts on impact investing and how it has evolved over the years. Thank you, Sonal, and आप सबको पचहत्तर में स्वतंत्रता दिवस की बहुत बहुत हार्दिक शुभकामनाएं. I think it's important to actually understand the origin of impact investing so that we can deal with the multiple issues. First issue is mm -hmm. is it niche or is it mainstream? Yeah. Second, we are on a platform that's actually largely discussing philanthropy. So, how is it different from philanthropy? Mm -hmm. Is it competing to philanthropy? Is it an alternate to yeah. philanthropy? So, so I'll take you back to my start. I I predate impact investing by eight years. The term impact investing got coined by some of us in two thousand eight. Uh, yeah, but uh, I started in two thousand one, and the only objective for us was 
that there is a significant need for philanthropy and that philanthropical capital requires to solve problems that cannot be solved by any business model. Mm -hmm. But there are a significant number of problems that can be solved by business model. And therefore, can we attract new capital? It's very important for you to understand we are not trying to take philanthropic capital away from philanthropic duties, but we are releasing by attracting new capital, commercial capital, to solve those problems that can be commercially solved. Which means we were really looking for entrepreneurs who are identifying large social problems and trying to build businesses around them that delivers commercial return. And by so, what you are doing is you are not tugging on to $300 billion of philanthropic capital globally. That is trying to deal with the challenges of 4 billion human, mm -hmm. human, human folks. Uh, but you are trying to appeal to the $300 trillion of mainstream capital, which needs to address uh, the needs of greed as well as the needs and wants of common people. And so really the impact investing role was to convince the mainstream to start looking at uh, greed as not the only goal, but beyond innovation, beyond newness, also to human equity as one of the goals. And that's really what impact investing has been trying to do appealing and knocking at the doors of mainstream capital and trying to convince them. So we are not the tail of the dog, but we are the tail that wants to wag the dog. And that's really the <laughs> role of impact investing. And that's the role that impact investing to some extent has started appealing to. Today, we are getting close to a trillion dollar of assets under management. And if that continues sooner or later, impact investing will become the, the mainstream. That means every person across the globe would be first asking, Am I actually making a difference uh, to the lives of the people while trying to satisfy my greed? Uh, and I think that's really what impact industry is. Thank you, Vineet, for these very interesting insights. Um, Anjali, uh, from you know, like the mainstream perspective, and now as they are now moving towards impact, so how are you looking at this space and what does it mean to you? Thank you, Sonal, and uh, great to hear from Vineet as well. Uh, it's been such an interesting journey on impact. So I'm going to go back even a few years before that. Um, today, what we call impact, and impact can be defined in so many different ways. Mm. But I think if you take the broader definition of impact, it includes creation of livelihoods, sustainability, uh, formalization in markets like India. Formalization has significant uh, benefits and returns, not just commercial sort of financial return, but also societal returns. But if we go back, say, maybe 25, 30 years, uh, there was an impact 1.0. 1.0 was sort of the mid 90s. Most of it was philanthropic capital. Mm. Uh, there was a real desire to do good. And there weren't business models that were equity fundable. So it wasn't a question of investment per se. But really getting non-returnable grant money, philanthropic capital foundations and family offices at that time, there were family offices as well. And that is, if you think about it and go back, one of the earliest areas of impact has been microfinance. So way back when microfinance was just starting to take shape in, say, the mid 90s, it was all about helping poor women. Mm -hmm. Then fast forward another, say, 10 years, we had impact 2.0. This is the mid 2000s. Impact 2.0 was the setting up of uh, largely, again, philanthropic capital, but going into returnable, investable instruments like mm -hmm. impact funding, where there was a trade off that was made either explicitly or implicitly between getting full market returns, but delivering good and social returns. And so we saw the emergence of you know terrific groups like Avishkar and, and Omidyar and Gates. And so a lot of it was actually still successful people and, and business houses and foundations putting their money into things that will do good, but also create lasting institutions. So not just philanthropy. What we are looking at today in some ways is impact 3.0, where there is a convergence and it is no longer a trade off. There is no longer an acceptable trade off that in order to do good, you have to be able to take lower returns than market when it comes to investment. There is still a need for the non-returnable capital, which is grant and philanthropy. So not taking away from that. There is still a need to think about, okay, where are the areas which require long gestation periods, unproven business models, like microfinance used to be. Today, microfinance is totally mainstream. But there are new models emerging, whether it is uh, rural tech, it is uh, agri, even space tech for that matter, deep tech, deep science-based 
and that also creates impact right so but the unproven business models perhaps not venture investable will take long gestation and hence require more patient capital that is still impact 2.0 now i think we are talking about impact 3.0 Okay, great. So, uh, so now this brings me. Uh, so, um, you know, as now uh, everyone's talking about how impact is becoming more mainstream. First, I would like to understand, uh, and Vineet, I would like to hear your thoughts because, like, when it was impact 1.0, like as Anjali mentioned, and it was this small niche, and now we see a lot more capital is flowing. So, can we also weigh its pros and cons? Like, if there's more money in the market, great, but then. are we also diluting the sector uh, is there a fear that greed will take over the sector as well you know so uh, what would you would like to hear your thoughts so no i think uh, dilution is a very uh, natural phenomena it happens in every space so uh, you go in deep tech you go in anywhere you will see dilution as things actually start scaling up now what does dilution mean dilution means that people coming with very different philosophies viewpoints etc it does not necessarily mean that you have actually abdicated the role that you are playing uh, and in any business uh, you go and meet hardcore tech entrepreneurs uh, uh, there are lots of people who are there because of the joy of tech and there are a lot of people who are there to make money out of tech mm-hmm. does not mean that you actually diluted uh, the uh, focus on tech similarly there are a lot of people in the space of impact investing who are there for the joy of impact yet trying to make money and then there are a lot of people who are there for the joy of return while trying to make impact now you cannot call this dilution it is just divergence of opinion because the sector is now allowing all kinds of people to come in and uh, those who are purist will always detest uh, this mixing <laughs> it's a very racial context i mean you can go out to any village you will see i will not mix with this so this is a very human concept and this kind of emotions are not very unnatural to happen uh, what is happening in reality is and i'll actually go back to the bigger vision the bigger vision was always simple can you convince 300 trillion dollars mm-hmm. to actually start taking up the responsibility to the shareholders as much as to the stakeholders and i think uh, it's a very simplistic thing uh, but this is really the responsibility for what is difference between investing and impact investing investing is a superset and impact investing is a subset of investing and within impact investing you actually go and look at a business model you ask this question do you make impact and then you do a commercial diligence when you are trying to actually do investing you ask do you make returns and then you look at what are the consequences or risk or doing this business for example if i have to do mining i know for a matter it is an extractive industry will i make money yes i will make money now do i want to make it do it by doing an extractive industry that will leave a big scar on the heart of the earth that's a question that i'll have to deal with but if you are a impact investor you know first question you will ask is what is this mining oh this does not fall into my space so you will then so every business that you will look at your first lens will be impact and once you have essentially said this business model does deliver impact then you move on and look at does it make money and how do you make money the concept of investing and impact investing is the same you find a large problem that you can disrupt you can find technology and talent that can play a role because with technology you can do the impossible without technology it becomes a linear model so when you go to finance like anjali mentioned microfinance or you go to agriculture these are very large problems not been disrupted for a lot period of time because they never attracted talent they never attracted technology and they because if these two things come in capital will always follow so what is impact investor doing they are actually trying to go to very complex social problems trying to attract talent and technology and then using capital to incubate these ideas so that commercial capital can then participate in in india you have seen it and happen in microfinance you are seeing it happen in agriculture mm-hmm. and you will see it happen in other social like waste water sanitation as well and that's really to me uh, so i i don't see it as a dilution now one can always say oh there was dilution you see microfinance happened then 2010 crisis happened and so therefore bad people came and they destroyed it no that's not true actually it happened because there was a conflict between when so when you are actually incubating something you you do not have self discipline and you do not have regulations and self discipline and regulation takes time to come in so microfinance happened a crisis happened 
post that self regulatory organization was created credit bureaus were created and regulation was introduced similarly in every space that is sensitive there are peer poor people are involved uh, we need to be a little more thoughtful but whenever there will be a dilution those challenges will come up but then self discipline and regulation will follow to put the things in the right context so will this cycle stop just because we are impact investors the answer is no this challenge will come this challenge will have to be dealt with and that's how nature goes so a lot of interesting points vinit and i'm gonna you know ask you again about shareholder versus stakeholder before that i'll ask anjali you know what are your thoughts like how are you looking at it like impact versus returns because commercial returns are something one of the biggest focus areas right and a lot of times it is us matlab stakeholder versus what vinit said a shareholder value and we are seeing that like in itc's case also currently so you know how do you balance that and are are we ready is the system mature to maybe make less returns because there's more impact uh, where are we on that journey so now that's a very very fundamental question what is the purpose of enterprise okay. for most of us in the last say half century that have been business educated based on the western model the purpose of enterprise somehow has become uh, singularly focused on shareholder value but if you actually look at the discourse and this is not necessarily impact investing this is large global capital large public markets and private markets the purpose of enterprise increasingly is being defined by some of the best most respected and um, in fact admired companies that it is not merely or only to generate shareholder return you have to think about your stakeholders in entirety and stakeholders include employees customers suppliers the communities in which companies live i'm very closely associated with the tata group for example right so even before there was this 2% csr the group always engaged and spent um significant money on uh, community development so education healthcare livelihood you know water waste and so on so consequently i would hope to see over the next few years not too far away but literally in the next decade an even stronger convergence of the shareholder return and stakeholder return we have lower retail participation in india uh, mm. in the stock market but in other markets where there is a high degree of retail participation either directly or through you know mutual funds or pension funds your shareholder and stakeholder ultimately is the same so if the air is getting polluted or we we are having significant climate impact and climate impact is here right it's so in your face now we are seeing shifting of climatic pattern we are seeing the impact on businesses for that yes. and we can come back and discuss that in more detail yeah. which is why i think that this notion of this is good for the world but that will generate returns and yes. never the twain shall meet is no longer valid ha. the twain ha. has to meet yes. and even <laughs> if it will really allow me to say this it is not dilutive because i think there is there will continue to be very very fundamental problems which will require philanthropic long term patient capital which does not expect a return that continues to exist there will require to be and, and this is somewhat individual there are people who are deeply passionate i mean nudge foundation is one of them it's impact first and yet to harness mainstream capital we are seeing hmm. there are very large funds um you know the tpgs and kkr is also setting up impact funds right so if you are able to get all that capital in i say bless it let's get as much capital in that is doing this dual purpose in uh, mm-hmm. investing and not keep them out already the largest global institutional investors whether it's a blackrock or a norwegian mm-hmm. pension fund they are very clear they have very strict esg guidelines mm-hmm. now esg is not strictly equal but it does act as an indicator mm-hmm. on are you doing enough impact positive mm-hmm. impact not negative impact mining mm-hmm. is a great example power generation is a great yeah. example the world cannot do without minerals and power mm-hmm. and they are extractive industries with high carbon mm-hmm. very very large high carbon footprints so you can't say i will never invest in that as a mainstream mm-hmm. investor you have to figure out a way where you can move these companies and influence them and the capital has a big voice capital can influence influence them in, to offset their carbon footprint to plant more trees for example you know afforestation is something that is being talked about um but we can keep going so i'm going to pause there and say it is not never the twain shall meet it is not diluted we should welcome as much capital as it comes yeah. in so the way i see it is now ki there is this spectrum of impact 
you know like from like these light touch models to some very deep impact models so uh, vinith uh, i would like to hear from you you know uh, as an impact investor but who also still has to give returns can you share through some anecdotes or some examples of your portfolio companies you know where uh, you know you saw scale but there were also these other models where probably return it was risky but you yeah it was high impact um, you see, Sonal, I think uh, if you look around global uh, benchmarks, I'm not talking about impact benchmarks. Let's look at about global benchmarks. They will all look like impact benchmarks. Mm -hmm. So you just look at uh, global venture capital industries returns. They are sub 10% yeah. mm -hmm. in dollar terms. Now, I don't know how many people in the in the in the philanthropic sector or in the in the world actually know that global venture capital industry gives sub 10% returns to its investors on an average. Now, this does not mean there are not people who are giving 35%, but it also tells you a large number of people giving 5% returns also. Mm -hmm. So it's not for impact funds to say we will give less returns. Even the mainstream give less returns than uh, mm -hmm. uh, high returns. And that spread will be there in impact. That spread will be there in mainstream as well. So really, returns are not the parameter on which investors debate. Investors never debate. Because when Anjali and I go to capital raise, we don't guarantee a return. In a funds business, you never guarantee a return. You only give a guidance to return and neither Anjali nor I will be uh, hanged if we don't deliver it. So we'll not go bankrupt, we'll not be beaten up, nothing will happen. You lose credibility, but that's it. So that's really what it is. So you are making a commitment, you, you show a vision and based on that you raise capital. Then you make those investments and you try to generate a return. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And that's really what investing is, the kind of investing we are talking about. Now, uh, when I started investing in microfinance, microfinance industry in India was 150 crores. Mm. Okay, today it is 3 lakh crores. Now, what better example of actually scale yeah. uh, and returns making impact than this? 150, la 150 crore to 3 lakh crores. Mm. That's the journey I have personally lived through. I have taken five companies to IPO from zero. Yeah. I was the first investor in all of them. Yeah. And some of them are really proud companies and they are morphed. They were microfinance institution. They became, mm -hmm. they were first NBFCs, then they become NBFC MFI, then they become small finance bank and some became banks. So we have seen the whole regulatory evolution as well. So microfinance is a great example. Let's look at agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, as an investor uh, in agriculture space, we were probably one of the first well-defined articulate investors in agriculture as well. Now in 2007, 8, 9, 10, when we started investing in agriculture, people started laughing at me saying, why would you ever make money in agriculture? It's, it's like people are laughing at uh, why would you do carbon investing? Because a lot of people did not know you can make money by afforestation. A lot of people did not know that tomorrow uh, electric vehicles will become uh, a craze. A lot of so sometimes what you are doing is you are actually predicting the future. We are doing it on the impact side. We are saying the impact is so important. The size of the market is so crucial. Farmers are so critical to us that if you don't make this investment, uh, you will not be able to deliver the size and scale of impact that you are seeking for. But because the space and size is so large, I mean, agriculture is huge. So if you are able to disrupt agriculture by creating benefits to those who produce uh, the food or the fruit or the vegetable or the cereal, you will be able to create significant returns for yourself. Now, we do not know. So when we make our investment, we do not know how do we generate that return. And that's where the risk comes in. So you're taking huge risks. What risk are you taking? We did not know anybody else will invest in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So we go ahead, we make investments. So what's our role as impact investors? So we are, I call it Begani Shadi Me Abdullah Diwana. We have somebody else's money, we give it to somebody else and we try to see the world change. But along with this, so why do we do this dance and routine, other routine, like we are doing charcha, we do sankalp and many other things. The reason you do it is you are trying to attract the attention of the mainstream. So will Sequoia invest in agriculture? Will Axel invest in agriculture? Will other Indian mainstream guys understand? That's our dance. So we are the dancers. We jump around, we dance around, we showcase, we take the entrepreneur, see this is such a good guy, this sector is big. This is our role. This is Anjali's role. This is my role. And therefore, when somebody like Anjali transcends from the mainstream, because she is more acceptable phase uh, mm -hmm. from the mainstream. I'm coming from a forest. I'm like a Tarzan. A lot of people in the investing industry do not find me that interesting because I am just too unrelated to them. So therefore, you require people like Anjali and very different kinds of people to walk into impact so that they can talk a language that can excite the mainstream guys. 
because they understand if Anjali has gone there, there must be some real reason mm -hmm. behind it. It's not that An Anjali has taken sainthood. She is doing something which she believes in and she is doing it because she sees value in happening it. Uh, they may actually see me as a guy who has gone crazy and who is trying to do it, but not to end it. And therefore, there is a need for balance of all kinds of us to come together okay. to make things happen. And that goes back to your earlier question also. It's not about returns. It's about people coming together. And when you start building an ecosystem, you have very interesting uh, roles and normatives uh, and narratives start coming through. That was interesting. So, Anjali, since uh, you know now you have to uh, show us how you are this beacon of you know for the investment sector, <laughs> impact investment sector, and you know, and how are you? How can main, the role mainstream index investors can really play, and how do they really look at now impact and returns? So, Vinith has been exceedingly kind. Um, and in some ways, we need too much pressure also, but never mind. <laughs> but he has been exceedingly kind. So, capital goes where they see returns. Yeah. yeah. And there is purposeful capital that mm -hmm. will aim to go where they will see returns plus purpose accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And if you take again a big step back and zoom out into capital, the really wholesale capital allocators, the pension funds, endowments, mm -hmm the big capital allocators you know we allocate capital at a small company level they allocate at global fund level they're also diversifying their portfolio right they also have stakeholders who say what are you doing for the world but meanwhile no compromise on my return yeah right pension funds need to continue to generate returns to support pension payouts and so on right so it's a question of this 300 trillion that vineet is referring to how much of that is getting allocated to non-returnable grant support, the philanthropic type of, I would say, investment or deployment. How much is going to, OK, we are going to take exceedingly risky bets. And it's OK, the high, very, very high beta. You may get 100x, you may get zero. Mm. And then I think what we are aiming to do is closer to the second versus the first. The first is zero return, right? You're not getting any capital back. Yeah. The second is saying, and that's where I think increasingly the discourse, and this is particularly in the space of climate today. Hmm. Climate and sustainability is no longer a nice to have. It is so amply clear that the way we have lived and consumed over the last 50 years is not something we as a global community can continue doing for the next 50 years which obviously raises lots of questions. You know, there are developed countries, so they have already gone up the development ladder. What happens to countries like ours, where we are still going uh, up the ladder? Who makes the trade-offs? Uh, where do you allocate capital? Where do you allocate actually collaborative outcomes, the ones that Vineet was referring to? It's not just about money. It's also about people, their minds, their thoughts, ideas, and talent coming together and saying, we're going to solve these problems, mm -hmm. but solve them at scale in a sustainable way. Right. So if you think about you cannot have a sustainable world, which we are realizing, unless it is inclusive. It is financially inclusive. It is digitally inclusive. Again, we cannot have a world in 50 years where your temp global temperature has gone up by one and a half degrees. Uh, it may not, we may not be able to live in such a world, right? So we actually have to bring all of that in, in a very integrated way. So com large companies are already doing integrated business models. I think the same thing is going to happen in the startup and early stage ecosystem where whichever way you cut it, uh, right? so it is that sort of thing, whether you are coming at it from a returns point of view or an impact point of view, as long as these spaces get the right amount of capital, the right kind of people and talent going in to solve really big problems. I think that is what we need. And uh, Anjali, can you share through some added, some of the portfolio companies, the kind of impact they are creating, uh, you know, would like to hear sure. from? Mm -hmm. Sure. Let okay. me speak about a couple of them. Uh, there is Terra. Terra is the first global climate school. Terra's purpose is to create a digital global community and at least 100 million climate workers. All of us can be climate workers. It doesn't mean that you are on a boat saving whales or protesting a dam, but each one of us has to become conscious of climate, 
mm. and bring it into our own organization so terra dot do great example it's a completely digital tech led company is it creating impact i would say it's creating massive impact at the same time we have companies like say an egos egos is formalizing the egg supply chain in india mm. it will help improve farmer incomes uh nutritional quality because those eggs will get to the consumer quicker faster um create new brands so it hits your how do you define impact livelihood sustainable agriculture or farming or food production better nutrition it hits all of those still relatively early company but we're getting great traction at the same time there will be uh, say investment in battery storage mm. the that the biggest hurdle today for large scale adoption of renewable is battery and battery technology that is at scale small you don't need utility scale uh someone has to develop that right so that goes into fundamental science material science those spaces are also seeing investment now yeah. earlier 5 years ago nobody would have invested in a space tech or a climatic database company mm-hmm. that is now becoming so dramatically quickly mainstream mm-hmm. that it is wonderful you know what i used to do so 30 years years ago when isro in doing you needed isro to do satellite payload design mm. now you have startups doing that yeah. outside of a lab at isro mm. Mm. so i think all of these are new investable business models which are not only doing good but are just great business models driving innovation and very investable so uh, so i see that tech for development which is actually become now you know very interesting lot of work is happening has that also then led to a lot of change or has really accelerated impact investment and also led a lot of these other you know mainstream in web because the scale technology offers mm-hmm. do you think that has also played a key role in um, you know getting a lot of interest from a lot of mainstream players Well, absolutely. So, if you think, even say five, ten years ago, to invest in agriculture, you had to really think about what is the available infrastructure, uh, and simple things like market linkages, mm-hmm. or farmer input. So, having adequate data to give farmer input to improve yields, for example, or to get products from farm to market in a way that creates more efficiency in the supply chain, that would not have been possible. Today, because we have the technology, and I. I I I say this all the time I think India is the most innovative country in the world when it comes to creating public digital infrastructure our India stack has been transformational mm-hmm. so having aadhar upi mm-hmm. has enabled payments in a way that are actually not possible anywhere else in the world mm-hmm. and it has innovated on tech it has innovated on ownership models mm-hmm. right so upi is a ppp it doesn't belong to the government it doesn't doesn't belong to any one single private sector player right so as public digital infrastructure gets created as physical infrastructure gets better so road connectivity and so on so i we will see models and we are seeing models right so we have a company called farmart that mm-hmm. is doing micro saas for your rural agri retailer and creating dramatic efficiencies for both input to farmer and from for farmer output to companies and they are able to do this in a very low capex way because the infrastructure now already exists mm. so as we see development mm. the ground level macro level development new models become available so if you don't mind i'll give you an example yeah, yeah. that yeah. would actually tell you how the hinterland is actually using technology to connect itself mm. make yeah. it inclusive the other way around So 2015, I met these two young guys in Bihar and Samastipur who came to me and said, "Listen, there is a lot of uh, the farmers are really not part of the mainstream because uh, we produce a lot of grains, but the grains are actually not tradable because well, you store them, they go waste. You when we actually harvest, we don't have the money to harvest, so the trader come pays whatever we takes away. So how about I convert uh, farmers' grain into digital currency?" I said. I said, "Well, sounds very exotic, but uh, so this is all. All conversation is in Hindi, chased Hindi, yeah, by the way. Uh-huh. It's taking place in Samastipur. Uh, so, but it was exciting. So we gave two crores. Uh, of course, everything went wrong, and then we gave another two crores. Something went right this time, and then uh, fast forward today, 2021. This company is growing at 300 percent, 
annualized growth rate. Okay, this will mm-hmm. cross 150 crore in terms of turnover. What do they do? They basically uh, so basically what happens in the farmer if you are in Bihar, you produce maize, wheat, and paddy. You actually a lot of small farmers have five, ten, twenty bags. You can't store them anywhere. There's something called Bhusawal, which is where they store. Wastage is around 48%. So if mm. you put in one bag, only half bag will come alive after the storage yeah. period. Uh, so what these guys are doing is they are convincing, and Government of India has very great policies. So these guys convince a local farmer to actually set up a warehouse. Then they lease that warehouse. They set up a digitization process. They let everybody know that if you have grain, you can put, you can come with one bag. We will actually give you a passbook in which the grain will be digitized. 70% of the grain's price would actually be given to you as a loan. And mm. then with this digital asset, we will trade it. And every day you will come to know a price and you can sell it whenever you want. Now, conceptually, the, what they are doing is they are actually creating multi-thousands of fungible warehouses, mm. which are all acting like a bank branch. Yeah. And like money is fungible, mm. digitized grain is fungible as well. So when they actually get an order, so one farmer want to send two bags and one farmer want to send 100 bags or 1000 farmers want to sell one bag each, they can actually digitally aggregate them and sell them. Now, of course, there is some level of innovation on the ground, also physical innovation. And there is some level of innovation that is taking place uh, digitally as well. But these two things coming together has created a miracle in uh, Bihar that is going to be the largest company ever coming out of Bihar. But the funny part is government of Maharashtra has sent an entire team to look at this model. India, <laughs> government of India has sent this model to look at this model. But it has disrupted anything and everything Indian warehousing had ever thought. Where did it come from? Samastipur of all places. <laughs> now that's the power of technology and innovation. And this is what you call disruption. And why is it impact investing? Because we had taken an extraordinary risk to make that investment. Why is it investing? Because it will generate a billion dollar industry or maybe a multi-billion dollar industry. The same company will deliver you a 10 billion, 15 billion, any number can be reached by this company. Yeah. Even more interesting, it can go any part of the world. So it can go and operate in Africa, it can go in Southeast mm-hmm. Asia, anywhere where you grow uh, wheat, pa- paddy, maize, you can take this company. So now, where is the conflict between return and impact? Ha, ha. True. But are there will be some models where there would be a conflict, right? Like some very difficult areas where probably tech will have a limiting role. What about so, that? So, uh, I think uh, you cannot live with the saying. So there are two ways to live life. One mm-hmm. saying, if I step out of my house, a bus will run over me. Uh-huh. So I will never step out of my house. <laughs> but the house can fall on you, right? Uh-huh. So you can either keep people hungry and let them die out of hunger or let them participate in the economy and strengthen them to deal with the vagaries of the mm-hmm. kind of risk you're talking about. Now, which side of the divide you are, you have to make yeah. your own calls. I can tell you me and Anjali are on this side of the divide. We are, <laughs> we are willing to take the risk of uh, being told that we are playing with witchcraft, we are doing wrong mm-hmm. things, etc., etc. But mm-hmm. in the process, our objective is, can we strengthen uh, mm-hmm. those who have been excluded for hundreds of years to be part of this uh, econo- economy, which is rapidly changing. Okay. We are not here to sit on judgment and say, huh. is everything going to be right? We okay. don't have the power. We are not God. So we mm. are not here to, we, we are participating in a journey mm. uh, and we believe some things will go wrong. And as I told you, if things will go wrong, mm. it will be morally obligated on people like me and Anjali to bring mm. in the self-discipline that is needed. And then the government will also step in like it happened in microfinance. You have to work on your side. The government will step in with regulations. And sometimes there will be harsh regulations. Yeah. Uh, but that's the reality. But that you won't stop progress just because you're scared of right. uh, somebody mm-hmm. bad, something mm-hmm. bad happening. Yeah, yeah. So tell me one thing. Um, uh, so um, Vineet, since we are speaking, I will just um, you know ask you first before I uh, ask Anjali. So you know, returns, financial returns are very easy to measure. And there are all these governance mechanisms, everything processes are in place. Um, social impact. Um, so, you know, what are some of the uh, measurement, the processes, governance processes around it? Because a lot of it may also be intangible, right? Um, so how do you look at it? How has that evolved? How has that system also evolved? So, Sunil, I actually, I think there is, uh, I, I, I've said it many times, but I'll say it again. So there is a spirituality of impact. And then there is a mathematics of impact. Okay. 
there is a lot of obsession on the mathematics of impact right now because the western societies like the mathematics okay mm -hmm. indians are very good at mathematics by the way uh, but indians are also very good at spirituality of impact now i'll give you some examples so let's look at the mathematics of impact if i make a investment of a million dollar in mumbai to create jobs versus a million dollar invest in koraput to create jobs where do you think i'll create more jobs mumbai mm -hmm. You don't need to really think too much. I'll create more jobs in Mumbai. So therefore, if I have to, if mathematics of impact is so important, I will actually keep investing in uh, Mumbai and creating more and more because there are two crore people to actually impact in a very small way. I don't know if you have ever been to Koraput. You will struggle to actually find a human uh, a person for a long distance of time. So when I invest in Koraput, uh, you are essentially saying you are not making impact because the mathematics of impact says you have only created 10 jobs. In, in, and somebody who has invested in Mumbai or Bangalore or Hyderabad has created more jobs. What is impact investing about? Is it about encouraging people to invest and create more slums in Mumbai? Or is it actually creating livelihoods and jobs where people live? And what did COVID teach us? COVID taught us that when COVID hit, who was walking from where to where? Did you saw people walking from Koraput to Bombay? Or did you see people walking from Mumbai to those people places? So what do you want to do? You want to create jobs where people live. To do that, you have to take risk. And then the mathematics of impact does not work. And until unless people around the globe and the world understand that the mathematics is important. Avishkar, I, I keep producing 110 million people impacted. What does that mean to you? That mathematics, I can you can put any formula. And there are lots of very strong and committed formulas created by the new entrant in the impact space. They have actually measured everything for every dollar invested that this kind of change in the lives are taking place. I can create even more complex formulas. Does that really change the lives on the ground? And that's why you have to see it to believe it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there is a lot of decision making taking place around the mathematics of impact. And mm -hmm. uh, by the way, Avishkar is very good at that. So we have we work on the mathematics of impact very rigorously because I learned very early that my investor sitting in New York and my investor sitting in Switzerland has no clue where is Bihar and where is Koraput and where is Mumbai. For them, India is a single monolith. <laughs> I have put in money and the person who gives me more numbers is better. Mm -hmm. So we did that, but that's not the reality and that's not get swayed by that. If you count all our numbers, all the numbers of all the very few impact funds, we have already solved world's problem. So there is no nothing left to be solved actually. But that's not the reality. It's exactly the same thing. I'm a forester and I can tell you if you go by the number of trees planted, India has been planted at least 10 times over. Uh, mm -hmm. And yet we don't have much for us. So, mm -hmm. so those are the challenges and we all deal with it. Mm -hmm. So impact measurement is important, but making impact is far more important than measuring impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people have to just learn that. It's a very simple thing, uh, but it's very difficult, uh, very difficult to understand, especially if you are very intelligent <laughs> so, and very rich. So, so uh, Anjali would like to hear from you now, you know, on some, what are some of the impact measurement templates that you look at, uh, you know, when you invest in firms? Right. So, uh, I think impact and me measurement is a given. Huh. One way or the yeah. other, whether we like it or not, it's the right yeah. measure, metric, wrong metric. Some metrics are required um, as investors and as fund managers. See, when you're investing your own money, you can do whatever that you want. Right? So, but mm -hmm. if you're investing other people's money, then there is an accountability. And uh, that accountability requires some baselining. So metrics, you have to do the right baselining, mm -hmm. then to be able to show whether you move the needle in a positive direction or not. Um, for impact metrics particularly, there are some things you can demonstrate short term, but a lot of it is actually quite long term. Mm. And unlike your typical business metrics, which say, what was the growth in revenue? What was the growth in profit? Um, mm. Growth in share price, for example, right? Which are all short term measures. You can show quarter to quarter. When it comes to measuring impact, spiritual and real impact, so mm. physical impact and spiritual impact, both, it is a longer term process. So time scale matters. Huh. What you can show in commercial returns in a quarter, you cannot show on impact returns because impact returns are so much more fundamental. It is saying because of these businesses, were we able to raise income of farmers by X percent over a five year period? Because it's not going to happen in a quarter, leave alone you know, even a one year period. Um, 
take things like uh, education so through education intervention or digital learning models that are now available because we have great digital connectivity that are available to uh, samastipur or even smaller villages right in the in the naxal areas and so on are we able to change the quality of their livelihood outcome because so many children were able to get better education and create livelihood third jobs i think the point that vinit made is a very good point but those are larger models than only impact right and of saying should jobs be created in crowded cities where then you are actually encouraging rural to urban migration and poor living conditions and the kind of stuff we saw during covid or should we actually be looking at larger more macro developmental models because we have better road connectivity because we have better digital connectivity encourage industries through policy support to go to where the people are so can we take jobs to where the people are versus people to where the jobs are right so i think all of these are much longer term metrics which uh, as an impact investor you are constantly trying to balance and you have to keep educating your own investors and some of them are actually quite educated and and enlightened and they get it so uh, then and, and one more thing sonal to what anjali has just said uh, it's not that the mathematics and spirituality cannot come together and it has come together carbon trading is actually a great example tree grows slowly but uh, what tree is doing uh, is very important to do it so the, the concept of net neutrality net net neutrality with uh, carbon trading is actually a very beautiful way of converting mathematics into impact uh, you are essentially trying to solve a problem by creating a trade offset which allows very rich people to actually allow uh, conservation and other things to happen in places which is less expensive and so i think what you require what i was actually trying to push is you need to actually bring the spirituality and mathematics together just the mathematics will actually skew the problem to a different mm -hmm. level and now this is where we have to learn from europeans uh, because they have been for whatever reason have been able to bring these two things together especially in the uh, in the carbon offset it has gone up and down but if you just look at the voluntary carbon offset pricing and the way the world is right now committing to net neutrality yeah. the quantum of capital that will move into natural resource based carbon sequestration is going to be amazing mm -hmm. uh, i think if impact really has to figure out a way to merge to showcase real impact anjali talked about so where there is a issue of policy there is a role of technology there is a longitudinal study there is research and academics all has to come together for impact to really transcend the boundaries and mm -hmm. therefore it is not just me and anjali we can solve it there is a significant participation from the government there is a significant participation from those guys who are creating technology and technology infrastructure like the india stack and other things but more importantly academics see uh, avishkar is a case study in stanford mm -hmm. in duke in so many places we are not a case study in india our stanford case study that teach taught in india by the way i came to know from many indians that you are a case study at ab some some very top institutes then i realized but they never studied us i realized they bought case studies from stanford to teach about us so that to me is actually very disappointing and we need to actually have these guys to do the case studies to bring this together and that is what is and that's where when anjali says that india is one of the most innovative in terms of coming up with new business models the rest of india has to also rise the startup mm -hmm. india is actually delivering the impact investing we are actually investors so as i said we give money to them we are not really taking any credit for the innovation that is coming from but the entire ecosystem has to rise to convert these thing and probably a uh, social stock exchange is a great example uh, mm -hmm. if we are able to use this policy infrastructure mm -hmm. to create an impact coin you yeah. are talking about crypto coins <laughs> create an impact, yeah, coin. impact coin and yeah. that impact coin creates trade that can deal with all kinds of impact and that's mm -hmm. where all of us should probably drive from uh, so um, vinit can you explain uh, you know elaborate a bit more on the role um, social stock exchange can play uh, and in bringing like you know not so just uh, just wanted to interject really sorry uh, there are a couple of questions that have been posted in the q and a tab uh, just wanted to point out if yes, you would so, like to bring them up yeah yeah actually a lot of these questions are related to like for example the this current question that i'm asking is related to sudha's question on uh, you know so, uh, social enterprises reaching an ipo and hence so i'm just clubbing both together 
Sunil, I missed what you said. Uh, Haan, so, uh, so Vineet, I uh, wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, like, uh, so this, this Sudha is asking about how social enterprises can, okay. you know, achieve a unicorn and IPO milestone. And, uh, you know, and then maybe we can club that with the point about that you were raising about social stock exchange and how so that see, can enable this. I, I think the unicorn status is actually a flawed concept in my view because you can achieve unicorn status without doing anything, especially if a lot of money chases you. Uh, so it's more about hype than actually fundamentals. And uh, so I would not get into unicorn, but if you can become an impact unicorn, that means you can touch billion lives, that, that actually a worthwhile goal to chase, you will automatically become a, a valued in unicorn as well. So can you do it uh, by making impacting lives and become a unicorn? That may be a great milestone. Uh, doing an IPO, IPO in my view is actually just an overhyped concept. It's a fundraising thought process. So whether you do it from public or private, you have to see it from that perspective. And IPO is a far more regulated activity in fundraising than it is private equity. So if you go for an IPO, you have to make so many disclosures. You will you are held accountable in so many ways that people have this wrong notion that it is a greed thing. It is actually a fairly tough thing to do, and you have to and you will then be measured by very different yardsticks as well. So if you are willing to open yourself up to that level of scrutiny, where people of all kinds will determine where your future lies, uh, then I would suggest uh, it is actually a better form of capital raise than taking it from either impact investors or private equity guys. You take it from us because uh, at that point of time, probably IPO is not open for you. Yeah. But I think the transition that is taking place right now is uh, there is a general feeling that uh, is there a way and social stock exchange is not something very unique or uh, or path breaking social stock exchange is essentially saying and i think that the reason why india is going to be different is this is actually an initiative coming from the government and the regulator it is mm -hmm. not a private vineet Rai or anjali bansal setting up an exchange because exchange yeah. is a technology right so there's right. nothing great you set up a technology and you say please trade here that's what it is but when it is regulated governed and managed and and has the so when you make a disclosure and if your disclosure is wrong, there is a going to be a cost to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to me, that is actually where mm -hmm. the social stock exchange comes into play. Okay. So very quickly, uh, Anjali, I'll ask you the next question. So ESG investing is, you know, like now ESG investing, impact investing, a lot of times they're using interchangeably. There's a lot of confusion. So would like to hear your thoughts on, you know, because companies also now use that as, their CSR and do good, uh, you know, uh, uh, PR, right? So I uh, would like you to throw light on that. And this is also a question yeah. from Shalini. Um, so ESG, of course, is a framework. It's a way of thinking about what dimensions you want to create impact in. So there's environment, there's society, there's governance. These are very, very broad. Beyond ESG, um, Actually, so companies are now starting to use the UN SDG, the mm. development goals, which are now sort of globally acceptable. Also, as sectoral areas where they can then measure, because how do you break up ESG? What do you, how do you define environment? What do you define as society and governance? So ESG is one framework. UN SDG are, are spaces that you can actually potentially invest in and create impact in. But ultimately, metrics, the way we look at them, and that these are all broad frameworks, but the metrics per se are company by company. Mm -hmm. So there are some companies that will create, say, livelihood outcomes. There are some companies that will create efficiency outcomes, uh, and efficiency and supply chain and market linkage, and hence accessibility. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some th that will create formalization. Uh, we also look at gender in a very significant way. Mm -hmm. And we haven't talked as much about gender here, mm -hmm. but people tend to think about, oh, if you're thinking gender, it must be impact. Like, duh, of course it is impact. 50% of the world is female. If you can help improve their lives and get them into mainstream, get them more productive, then of course it is going to be massive impact for the world. Yeah. So it is not about doing good. It is actually about being smart and using right. all the resources we have as a world to solve our mm -hmm. problems. So um, I think different funds and different investors look at impact measurement in a different way. The generally accepted frameworks are ESG, uh, along the UN SDG framework also. And then more recently, the uh, global accounting standards are adopting something called the climate-related financial disclosure norms. Hmm. So there's a task force on climate-related financial disclosure norms, which is now that climate-related disclosure, disclosures are now being accepted and adopted, not necessarily by startups 
thus far, but by the larger companies, but it will come down. And it's becoming quite clear that uh, in order to get to the climate outcomes, the net zero outcome that we spoke about earlier, Bharat net zero, of course, is now uh, a process that is underway. You know, Mr. Jensen has introduced the bill in parliament. It is being acted upon. But to get to that net zero, and we don't have that much time, we actually have to transform literally every sector of the economy. Yeah. Manufacturing, yeah. agriculture, transportation, logistics, energy production, energy consumption. So how we live how we consume, so both at the wholesale industrial and policy level, but also at our individual consumption level. So these are all now interrelated. So I don't think there are metrics, baselining and measurement is still a work in process. Okay. Okay. We are making great strides, but still a work in process. So just wait, wait, quick, uh, just one line. Uh, in fact, ESG is a framework, as Anjali mentioned, and it can be applied to any company. Yeah. reliance etc and i think people are talking about hiding this is not hiding behind it it's actually taking an accountability and exposing yourself so if you actually under the environment social and governance you are found to be not performing at the level mm -hmm. then there are issues there are significant global issues for large companies yeah. for example if you want to actually open a plant in some other part or you want to buy a company there are some indian corporates who have not been able to acquire companies simply because they were not seen uh, in great light from an ESG perspective and therefore people are actually spending significant time and you have to have a corrective framework so when you apply ESG you have to work on a corrective framework to actually improve your ESG score so that's actually one on the impact side there's a question here as to what kind of frameworks well I think there is no single framework uh, people are talking about iris iris is actually a taxonomy so it's not really a framework it's a taxonomy so that people can talk about the same thing in the same language uh, important innovation, but done quite a long time back uh, mm -hmm. when we started impact investing. Uh, this kind of innovation was done. Uh, uh, Rockefeller spent a lot of money behind this. So I think the taxonomy is there. The important issue is what kind of framework. So Avishkar has a very evolved framework. We think we have a very evolved framework, but I think we are a large institution like BlackRock and others who have launched public uh, impact funds and TPG and others have come up with their own frameworks. Uh, our frameworks are very simple. We do an impact baseline survey every time we make an investment. Then we do an impact projection and then we do impact reporting. So you have to do three parts of it. You first start by uh, when I am investing, where is the company? Uh, because we do early stage startups, etc. Normally it is zero, zero, zero or very insignificant. Then you actually say once I invest, where will I take this company? Like you do it for a business, we do it for our impact side as well. And then we report the progress. It could be good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, we report against it. And that's really the framework. Uh, that's a, Now, whether that impact is good, bad, who there is no judge word, judge, judge is there. So neither Anjali nor I are being, being judged by somebody. We say this is what we are doing and then people accept it. Some people don't accept it. Some people may not like it. Uh, but that that form of a regulatory capacity has not been done. So some gentleman who is working on this, which government can adopt, uh, has to take all these feedbacks into account, very different kinds, and then say, what is it that could be a, normally when you're doing very different kinds of people, you will come for a lowest common denominator, not really the uh, the best one, but something that can be done by our. And I think social stock exchange, again, is a very critical uh, determining factor for what those disclosures would be. Okay, great. We need to. Uh, I have only two minutes left, so quickly wrap this up. Uh, my last question would be: very uh, one point on what is the biggest change you would like to see in the sector, like whether in terms of mindset, regulation, policy, government intervention. Uh, Anjali, what are your thoughts? I want to say all of the above, <laughs> but uh, I would like to get a better understanding for there to be a more sort of widely accepted understanding that impact, so purpose and profit are not separate. We have to have a converged profit and purpose model, mm. uh, integrated business models, and get large amounts of capital that goes into quote unquote impact investing. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so, uh, Vineet, what are your thoughts? Your last. Thoughts? Uh, I think the only thing to tell the people who are in the mainstream uh, in India and across the globe that impact is natural. It is not an mm. unnatural activity, it's a natural thing. That uh, sustainable development goals that Anjali talked about imagine a world free of hunger, poverty, and inequity by 2030. Yeah. Now, that's a very ambitious, uh, yeah. but a very natural goal. Why would you want people to be hungry and living yeah. in inequity? Uh, so therefore, whatever we are talking about, whether it says you call it impact investing, you call it Timbuktu, I don't care. 
but uh, this is a natural goal the ideal situation should be that there should be no impact investing they should only be investing which should uses the principle of impact investing right. and if we are able to achieve that i don't think so we will have neither we need charchal or sankalp nor naj nor avishkar <laughs> that's really the ambition that we have. great so that was a very poignant point that uh, you have raised vinith and in i just last 5 seconds left so thanks everyone this was a very interesting discussion a lot of gratitude to the speakers who have really helped us deconstruct a lot of these difficult nomenclatures and laid bare you know what actually means what and what what are some of the key trends in impact investing and i'm sorry to the audience for some of the questions we have not been able to answer but uh, i am sure manoj is here who can help us and um, get you the answers on email thanks a lot for your time and happy independence day all of you thank you so much everyone thank you sonal for putting this uh, together and i think in hindsight uh, one hour seemed uh, a little less <laughs> so maybe we'll have another version of this uh, sometime soon um, a quick uh, sort of announcement to the audience we have a couple of very interesting sessions happening today till uh, 2 pm so please feel free to browse around and uh, go to the event of your choice a very very happy independence day to everyone again thank you so much thank you thank you everyone thank you anjali thank you happy independence day everyone